This is available in the Category 5 costume store, which you'll find on our website, category5.tv. There are links uh, there up until Halloween if you're looking for a costume. Uh, this bad boy includes shirt, collars, pips, communicator pen, pin, communicator pen, communicator pin. So it's all in here. And I got the size medium. Available sizes are small, medium, large, and extra large. So hopefully the medium will be about right for me. There's the packaging. Jot, it looks like this is going to need some ironing. I could use some help. But we'll see. All right, let's take a look. <laughs> I, I, you can, do you, sm do you smell the geekiness? Seriously. These are actually not bad. These are metal pips that were included. I honestly thought I was going to be buying pips separately. There's the, uh, the black one. And uh, I've got four gold ones. There they are. And these are pins. Okay. With clasps. So that's going to actually puncture the uniform. So you want to choose your rank so that you don't uh, end up damaging the uniform. And then nice little reflective metal pips that uh, look kind of like the genuine article. Quite impressive, actually. There it is. That <laughs> looks really sharp. If you're interested in dressing up with me at Halloween this year as a Starfleet officer, you can order uh, these these uh, uniforms off of our website, category5.tv. Visit our costume store, and uh, you'll be able to uh, also get one of these for yourself. Episode number 158. Oh, there I go 158 already. 158 of them. 158. Category 5 Technology TV. That was like an 8 slash cough. Well, I'm here to cover for you. All at the same time. Eric and Cough Medicine <laughs> is here to help me yeah, out tonight. Super Anti Spyware Coffee. Bro, I need some Super Anti Spyware to get this virus gone. Ha! You're supposed to go boom. Sure, I left the kid at home. Yeah. <laughs> Tonight we're going to be looking at data security. Leave my cup alone. Your cup is right there. Do stuff Leave to your cup. Leave the one with the 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 germs. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know. <laughs> okay. Now just don't touch that pen because now it's got the germs. Tonight we're going to be looking at data security. Uh, what you should do with your computer if you're going to recycle it or give it away or sell it. Uh, we're going to be checking that out. Uh, and uh, lots of cool features coming up. We've got lots of questions. I don't. Uh, you've got a new computer here tonight. That yeah. Kind of threw together for you. I have a keyboard tonight. Let's go to keyboard. I have a keyboard. Look at that keyboard. What are all these letters? Tonight here? is the uh, 23rd anniversary of Star Trek: The Next Generation. In case you're wondering. Wow. Live long and prosper. Yeah. To all the viewers. <laughs> Brilliant. Hey, everybody. Welcome in the chat room, Category 5tv Good to see you. All right. Cool. So you've got uh, you've got lots of email. I don't know if you've seen all the email. I, I see there's quite a few things yeah. in there. Good, we'll good. have so some, we we'll have some questions for you. Definitely. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff going on. Tonight is the first episode of Season 4 of Category 5 Technology TV. And it's Indeed. great to have you here joining us for this special day. 
Thanks, Akimoto. Cool. All right. What do you got coming up in the news? Well, I can tell you what's coming up in the newsroom. Shares in Research and Motion dropped today following yesterday's announcement of their iPad alternative, the Playbook. Browser Sync Service X Marks is going to shut down. Dr. Mark Wright is using his position as city councillor to fight the good fight on behalf for open source software in Bristol City, UK. And uh, Twitter's latest exploit redirected users to offensive websites. Hmm. Hmm. And Gallium has introduced its DirectX 10 slash 11 implementation for Linux. Stick around for the latest news from the Category 5 TV newsroom. Brilliant. Sounds like we've got lots coming we've up. We've got tonight. lots coming up. A couple of people in the chat were mentioning that uh, they're having trouble with the Justin.tv feed. So just quickly before we get rocking the questions, I want to take a look, just make sure everything's working for us uh, on this end. So let's see how she's going. And of course, we do have other feeds on the site. We've got the WMS feed, uh, which if you're on Linux, will open right up in Totem. Uh, but uh, looks like Justin.tv is functioning just fine. Oh, might have some problems. Maybe not. Uh -oh. Welcome to Justin.tv with super delay. All right, everybody. Let's uh, let's try to kick this into fast gear. Let's Watch this. We kind of there we go. Let Justin TV catch up. All right. We'll give it a second there. Hey. There's Let everybody. Uh, for those of you who are <laughs> seeing this after. And for those of you who are just coming back on with Justin.tv, hello! Look hey. at that! We've there got go. a, a semi-live feed on Justin.tv tonight. That's great. Welcome. There's a delay just in case you start cussing and stuff? I think that was... No. Yeah. No? <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Rated G. All right. Great to see you all. Hope you didn't miss too much there, but uh, for those of you who are trying to catch us on the Justin.tv feed, there was like, I don't know, there was like a five-minute delay there for some reason, so... We'll, uh, we'll blame that one on the, uh, on the free service for tonight, and it uh, looks like it's back up and running. So, here's hoping. All right. If you're having too much trouble on Justin.tv, try our WMS feed, and if that's not working out for you, <coughs> pardon me, uh, feel free to catch the, the show on the DL. Uh, you can pick it up after the fact on our website, category5.tv. Uh, you can also get it through our RSS feed, the vodcast.category5.tv. Uh, so hopefully everything will uh, will come together for you. I see Gadwell Office says the stream is buggy, very frequent stubbles. He's not talking What's about my lack of shaving this afternoon. That's not what he's talking about? Not that kind of stubble? We're certain. Okay. <laughs> we'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kick a couple of things here, There's guys. a suggestion Make of sure starting that, uh, and stopping the Justin TV might I help. I did that. Oh. I did that. Okay. And that's what got us kind of uh, up and running here. Okay. This is exciting viewing on Miro. Right now, you know, the first five minutes of the show. Well, hello. But let's see what happens if we, uh, if we try to... Let's see what happens. That's the best we can well, do. Well, I'm here. We'll see. We're here. Oh, and people are saying, Gadwill's mentioning that WMS feed is much better. So, my guess, Justin.tv having some kind of issues tonight. Sorry, gang. Chris Wright wants, how do we change to WMS? Right on our website, category5.tv. You'll see on the home page during a live broadcast, there's actually this uh, watch Category 5 live. You've got Justin.tv pop-up player. That's the one you're trying to watch right now that's not, that's not working for you. Uh, there's the backstage pass. And then there's WMS in your own player. What that's going to do, uh, like I say, if you're on Linux, that's going to pop up in Totem. Uh, Windows is going to bring it up into Media Player. Uh, Mac will bring it up probably into iTunes or some other player. But that will play cross-platform. So. Shouldn't have any trouble with that one. All right. So here we go. put a put a little link there for you. There we go. Thanks, Akimoto. Okay. Cheers. All right. So we'll uh, we'll rock on. Here we are. Sorry, gang, that uh, that you're having trouble. Justin.tv is a fantastic service, but uh, you know we can't complain when they if they have issues once in a while. Uh, so we'll just kind of plow through, and and uh, I'm glad that we're able to offer uh, some alternatives for you. Okay. So, how you been? I have been well. I survived Good. hockey last week. Yeah. I survived your pretzel party here last week. That was exciting. I survived lots of stuff last yeah. week. Good. Yes. Good. We should say hello to some new viewers. Love to. Got a list of some new viewers here. 
This looks like a lot of letters. DGTL DNA from the USA. Hey there. Is here. M Forte from the USA. Newtamon from Seattle, which I guess is USA. Mm -hmm. And Washington. Poster from Toronto, or is that Toronto? Um, Autumn Blanchard 20 from Colorado. Nice to have you here. And you're going to have to help me with Are that you, one. I, what's up with your eyes tonight? Well, I think it's your writing. Is that what? I, I think it might be. Could be. <laughs> and hello to B. Forsyth from Barry. Wow. Barry. Nice to have a local viewer. Ignacio82 is out there um, from Places Unknown. And while Didio from Northumberland, Monesto. Northumberland, where's that? I don't really know. Where you is Northumberland? Know? The Northumberland Strait runs between New Brunswick and PEI, but I don't think so that's it. I don't know. Does anybody out there, somebody in the uh, chat UK. room is going to tell us soon? In the United Kingdom. Oh. Well, there, there you go. Yeah, there we have it. And nice to have uh, another new viewer from the United Kingdom. And I really want to get this right. From French Polynesia, it's Mahievnov. No. Uh, man, yeah. Yeah. Man, new. Man, yeah, new. Okay, we're blaming. John wrote that but down that's from, for us. Uh, that's from French Polynesia. <laughs> it's nice to have you here. <laughs> People uh, giving us difficult bonjour. to pronounce aliases. But bonjour, great to see va? so many uh, new, new faces this week. New Psalm, Robbie, and Eric. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you with the French. You're so fancy Canadian. Um, if you're new here, uh, if you haven't already registered on our website, category5.tv, just make sure you sign up. It's a free service, and uh, being a registered user, you're going to get uh, some bonus features off of our website, uh, especially as we move into Season 4. We've got uh, more and more features that are going to be uh, predominantly for registered users, so make sure you do that uh, at category5.tv. Will they get a TNG outfit? For 40 bucks. Oh, okay. Sure will. That's a heck of a deal at twice the price, Robbie. I think John should be wearing one, too. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're pretty great, and uh, our partnership with, uh, with Party Mart, they're going to actually uh, support the show uh, in a bit of a, <coughs> pardon me, in an affiliate role. So for everybody who buys their costume from, uh, from that link uh, on our website, then you'll actually uh, be sub indirectly supporting the show at the same time. Very cool. All right. Good to see everybody in the chat room. I'm going to try not to miss uh, miss your questions. Make sure you send them attention to uh, Robbie F. Uh, or Eric Kid. Hey, what chat did room. I do now? Okay. Hey. Yeah. Okay. He's learning his <laughs> learning his way around. It's all good. You know your way around. I'm. You're looking at me like I'm finding okay, my way you around. Want to, you want me to read this? Sure. Yeah. Well, we have a couple of questions here. One from Raj Gopal. What is the importance of... Oh, okay. I was just saying, hey. He's saying hi, and I walked all over it, didn't I? I'm sorry. Before, before you read it, uh, Gadwell Office, wondering if, uh, if the Cat 5 store, <coughs> pardon me, is going to ship to the U.S. Uh, yep, absolutely. So make sure you check it out. Sorry. Hey, Raj. He wants to know what the importance of Wi-Fi technology and TV is. Ah, the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi. Well... You're, you're looking at, uh, you know, Category 5.TV is a service that's available through the Internet. It's like a TV program that's uh, viewable s strictly through Internet mediums, right? So with a Wi-Fi enabled TV, these uh, television devices, <coughs> pardon me, whoa, <laughs> you're going to try to work through tonight. Yeah, just slap me on the back. These, uh, these TVs are coming out to be more connective. You've, uh, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, back in the 80s, seen in the future, the, the fridge with the touch screen and stuff like that. So now the TV, being basically a computer in and of itself, becomes a media rec receiver for a media server. So if you've got, uh, for example, a PlayStation 3 connected in uh, wirelessly to your, <coughs> to your network, things like that, uh, or if you've got an Unraid box or files uh, in your network or on the internet that you want to be able to play on the TV, the Wi-Fi support on the TV is going to give you access based on what, uh, what, sof <coughs> what software and abilities come with that particular model, uh, you're going to be able to watch TV shows through wireless uh, networking. 
You can have a server with, uh, with all your movies on the server so that uh, you don't have to worry about swapping disks all the time and things like that. But especially stuff like being able to watch internet-based television programming, uh, such as this show. <laughs> so, oh, you need to do more of the talking tonight. <laughs> Sorry, my friends. <laughs> well, earlier today I was like, I don't even know, like, because I, I, I always stick it out with the show. And I'm trying not to breathe on you. But, that uh, would be appreciated. Okay. Yeah. But this morning I was, I was iffy. I was like, am I going to be able to do it tonight? So. Whiffy? Iffy. Iffy. Okay. <laughs> there was a suggestion that uh, um, one of us wear Beldar Conehead uh, mm. outfit for Halloween. That sounds like something Guru would say. <laughs> <laughs> Told him if he wanted to buy me the outfit, I'll wear it. For sure. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That'll I'm in. Two. Count me in. That'll be for next year. Or m mix it up. Starfleet and Coneheads. <laughs> <laughs> a Starfleet Conehead officer. Oh my. Wrong galaxy. <laughs> Any questions in the chat <laughs> in the chat room? Oh. Well, let's see. We have another one here from the email. <laughs> you guys are gonna get sick of that sound. <laughs> Me coughing. All right. Well, we have another uh, question here from Dan Murphy. Hey, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hey. Uh, I got an okay to dual boot my laptop. Installed Ubuntu cool. a while ago on it. Tried to get updates today and failed. I got a weird error message about having a blocked IP address. I think we might NAT and then NAT again. Not sure, but I think the repository servers think I am coming from 10.x.y.z or Z for you uh, American folks out there. How can I work around this and get my updates other than taking my laptop home? Hmm. It's a laptop. Take it home. It's portable. That's why it's a lot. Oh. That's, Sorry. Yeah, that's the whole idea of a portable computer. Sorry, Dan. That was an easy answer. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, we're not going to do that to you. Uh, apt on CD comes to mind. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. Apt on CD. .sourceforge.net. Basically just uh, lets you get the applications, download it at home, switch them over you know, like burn them to a CD, take them to work, and uh, install the updates on your computer. Another thing, though, if you if you have a similar uh, similarly similarly configured computer at home, <coughs> I, I corrected myself because I knew he was going to correct me. So, if you have a similarly <laughs> configured computer at home, a you can, similar speech impediment. Yes, you could uh, you could run the updates at home and then copy your apt cache folder, uh, which would give you all the Debian packages for the updates. Uh, you could burn those to a CD, throw them on a flash drive or something, bring them back and forth. You know, we don't know but the background. Maybe Dan doesn't want to go home. Doesn't want to take the laptop <laughs> home. Tap okay. into the neighbor's Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd want to know what's causing that kind of behavior, because that's a little bit uh, on the odd side if it's reading an internal IP address. Uh, when you're trying to run your updates. A little bit strange. But, but those are two suggestions that uh, you might want to look into. aptoncd.sourceforge.net. I'll post the link in the show notes for episode number 158. Uh, or uh, grab your apt cache folder from a computer that's, uh, that's getting the updates, like, like your home computer. Uh, but it would have to be the same version of Ubuntu. So, Good luck. Let us know. And if anyone has any uh, other suggestions or better suggestions in the chat room, uh, please post those, and uh, I'll just mention that you can check the chat logs uh, for episode number uh, 158, and you'll find this at about 7.19 p.m. in the logs. Thanks for the question. <laughs> what are, they, are they sending me a French word? En français, pas tous les Américains sont monolingues. You're going to offend uh, you know, people with your pronunciation. Yeah, I, I, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm pretty much a, a unilingual uh, anglophone who uh, knows I'm a few very, French words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get myself in trouble here on Category 5 I have a feeling that some of the TV, French words I? that you know can't be said on the, on the show. Well, they probably can be. Yeah. Um, although... <laughs> no French people are listening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, you're not. You're, you're rub, well, rubbing your hands. And well, I, I'm, I have another... Uh, oh, yeah, I saw this one. Oh, I like this. I just, I don't even know what the question is. I just like the way it starts out. Well, we, we started looking at this one a couple of weeks, oh, a few weeks ago. Oh. But question number three in the trio of questions. Usually when, when somebody sends us, when you send us a question live at category5.tv, I, I always ask, break it up, like, send us a separate email for each question. Uh, in this case, the user had broken it up into three parts. So we'll, uh, we'll try to answer all three parts, breaking it down. <laughs> but it's always easier and, and it ensures that we can get you on the show if, uh, if you break it into separate emails. Okay. So we don't miss stuff. But that's I, what happened I, I here. did want to address something that just came in in the chat room. Uh, yeah, telling okay. me that ahead. not all Americans are monolingual or unilingual. That's not what I was pointing at. I was saying Americans pronounce the 26th letter of the alphabet Z, whereas here in Canada and the United Kingdom it's pronounced Z. Unless you're Robbie and he says Z sometimes. I'm just thinking back to Z modem. That could have been a Z modem. Couldn't have been. Do you drive a Z28 or a Z28? I don't even know what that is. No. Oh, I'm a geek. Okay. I'm not into cars. Okay, okay. Uh, so, we'll go back to... <laughs> Sorry, Agamotto. Um, we were going down to question number three, were we? Yes. This is uh, Jim Kerwin. Hey, Jim. But, but I do like the way Jim started this well, out. Feel free to read it. Oh, co-hostless one. <laughs> so, three. Increase the size of a virtual box dot VDI file slash drive. Is it possible to increase the size of a virtual box, virtual hard drive, a .vdi file? And I had allocated 30 gigabytes, which seemed to be a good guess at the time for running XP Home and a couple of Windows-only programs with large, greater than 5 gigabytes, data files. Alas, I'm now thinking that it might have been better to allocate 40 gigabytes. Do I have to create a new, larger virtual machine and reinstall everything, or is there a way to grow the current VDI or transplant it mm. into a larger pot? Wow. I think the easiest the thing to do... imagery is lovely. Brilliant wording. We, we can't go wrong with this. <laughs> I think the uh, best way to look at it is approach your virtual machine as if it's a real physical computer. In a real computer, if you wanted to increase your hard drive space, what you would do is you would install a new hard drive and then you'd use imaging software to get the data off of the old drive and transfer it over to the new hard drive. So looking at that in a virtual machine environment, if you were to take your, your virtual box uh, with the power of the virtual machine turned off, you would create a, a new, basically a second hard drive in that computer. Make it the size that you want, 40, 60 gigs, whatever you like. And once that's created, boot up from a clonezilla CD ISO. Where'd my CD go? It's over there. Okay. I can actually. You, you don't even need to burn it to CD because this is all that happens if you do. <laughs> the burn process went fine. The burn process went went fine. You just get it home to Eric's place and it's destroyed. It didn't install so well. If you download the Clonezilla <laughs> ISO, you can use you can use the ISO, mount it without even having to burn it. So you don't even have to waste a CD. I say waste a CD because that's what Eric does. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even use that for a coaster, man. So you boot up from that ISO, right? You've got two hard drives, virtual hard drives, connected to that, com that virtual computer. And Clonezilla will see the two drives. So then you copy from one to the other, clone the hard drive. Uh, and then uh, you'll be able to then remove the virtual hard drive from virtual box, boot the system from the new 40 or 60 gig drive, and uh, everything will be in place. You don't have to reinstall things. You're just going to have a larger hard drive when you boot uh, from the new hard drive. Quote unquote hard drive. It's virtual. But uh, treat it as if it was a physical system. And uh, I think that'll work really well for you. And don't drop your CD. Don't even bother to burn it. Okay, okay. okay. Just use the ISO. All right. There you go. I'll post some links for Clonezilla, stuff like that, uh, in the. Uh, in the, in the uh, Show notes for episode number 158. <laughs> Made it through. Got oh, to the nicely end. done. Um, Chris Wright is uh, wondering if you could explain the difference between an NVIDIA GeForce consumer video card and an NVIDIA, NVIDIA, that was a pronunciation problem, <laughs> NVIDIA Quadro workstation video cards. Well, if you're from Eric land, it's NVIDIA. <laughs> I'm thinking the workstation cards are more geared towards... Uh, if I've got it right, more geared towards like CAD applications. Um, 
well, be nice. I'm getting worked up, ready to go to hockey, so. What does that mean? The, uh, like the quadro cards and stuff. Uh, I, I think the way that I would compare them, just to put it real, uh, really into lay terms, I would look at the GE Force card as the home user, the gamer, the self-broadcaster. I'm using a GE Force card here. Um, that type of user. It's a different type of card uh, designed for that kind of usage. However, if you get into the Quadro line of stuff, you're talking about uh, animators, people who are really drawing a lot of power off of the GPU, um, people that need to be rendering 3D CAD drawings, uh, people that uh, are going to be rendering, say, uh, video, uh, like animated video, cartooning, cartooners, or stuff like that. Um, I think that's the most basic. And, and that's really all that I know as far as as far as specs go. There are differences in what uh, you know the the size of the the chips on the cards and stuff. I don't think that's what you're looking for. But essentially, for the home user, GE Force is the way to go. Um, if you get into the quadros, you're looking at more professional application, but not talking professional as in office use. I'm talking stuff like the CAD work and the and the 3D animation, actually generating. Not talking gaming. I'm talking about actually creating. Somebody who creates games will want to go with a Quadro. Somebody who plays games will want to go with a G-Force. So, I hope that kind of helps. I don't know a whole lot about uh, about that line of cards, but uh, does that help? All right. Yeah, Agamotto saying, think Lightwave or Blender. So that would be. I would put that into the Quadro end of things. Somebody who's rendering 3D creating their own 3D, you're going to get much better performance out of a Quadro card versus the GE Force card, which is designed to be, which is meant to be used with pre-rendered uh, 3D. Cool. Cool. Well, that helps, I hope. I, I say that a lot. I, sh I should just say, there you have it. I should have like a catchphrase. There it is. <laughs> I'm not asking for you to invent a catchphrase for me. Oh, I'm I, I saw the eye. You, know, you, you could see that, could you? Okay. Keep it at the chat room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, let's see. Somebody had a command line uh, version of how to uh, clone a virtual box. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there could be there could be a tool. Did they actually post? So chat box, yeah. check that out. All right. Yeah, there's a. There's a suggestion in here. VBox manage. I seem Import. to have lost it already. VBox manage clone HD. Well, that's cool. So step away from needing the third, the third-party software, and just use the stuff that's built in with VirtualBox. Indeed. But that's uh, that's the command that. Uh, who was that that was saying that? That was good guy. Good guy. VBox manage. I can see manage. that from here. He's, he's, I don't clone. know. I just I don't know. I've never used a chat room before, he says. Oh, boy. <laughs> From chapter 8 of the Virtual Box Manual. <laughs> VBox Manage Clone HD. Hey, that's even better. This command duplicates a registered virtual hard disk to a new image file with a new unique identifier. Okay. So check that out. That'll uh, that'll give you some help there too. Either or is going to function for you. And I've I've done it using the clonezilla method and uh, that you know that always works. But uh, but this looks great. Built right in. Vbox manage remember <laughs> on your Linux system that Vbox manage is case sensitive. So when you see it like that and it's kind of funny because depending on who the package distributor was, it will change how the case sensitivity is. But usually it's like that. Capital V, capital B, O, X, capital M, Anage. You know, if you're not uh, really paying attention, it almost looks like Conehead if you slip some letters around there. Sorry. Clone HD. Yes. Just like that. All lowercase. <coughs> Clone HD. All lowercase. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Just remember it's case sensitive. Oh, look at that. It's time for the news. Are you ready for it? I think I am. Just clicking around. All right. 
<laughs> it it could happen, that? Jot. It could happen. Okay, from the Category 5 TV newsroom. As I mentioned, shares and research. <laughs> what in just happened? <laughs> okay, move on. Keep going. Okay, read. <laughs> well, I thought I was doing I heard a bang. News. I heard a thump. I heard... Okay. Shares in research in motion. Makers of the BlackBerry dropped by 4.4 points today following yesterday's announcement of their playbook, a tablet device rim hopes will compete with the Apple iPad. It was a little A and a big A. While at first glance the playbook sounds exciting enough with specs like dual webcams, a gig of RAM and full support for Adobe Flash, RIM seems to have jumped the gun on their announcement as the playbook is not even near ready for release. In fact, demo units are not even available for testing by media personnel. So chances are good the hype surrounding the new tablet will die off even before it sees release. For all we know, the playbook may be a pretty cool device and here's hoping it is. But seeing as most people who are interested in buying a $500 tablet will already have done so by the time it's released, we just don't have high hopes. Browser Sync Service X Marks has announced it will shut down in January. The service, despite having over 2 million active users, was unable to monetize and will begin sending out email to advise its users. Begun in 2006 as Fox Marks, it was initially only a bookmark syncing service, but expanded to sync passwords and open tabs across multiple platforms and browsers, including Firefox, Internet Explorer, Chrome, and Safari. Similar features are now offered as part of the Firefox and Chrome browsers, but no other tool offers them across multiple browsers. The service did support the usage of any server to host the synced content, and many users hope that Xmarks will choose to open source their software so that it can be modified and supported by users. CEO and founder Todd, oh, we're going to have trouble with this. Uh oh. Agolnik thanked his investors, colleagues, translators, and users for their support of the product, quoting Douglas Adams. So long, and thanks for all the fish. <clears throat> hmm. Dr. Mark Wright, who was elected to Bristol City Council in 2005, is fighting the good fight in promoting the use of more open source software within City Council. In discussing the Council's plans to get more open source software into Bristol schools, Wright is quoted as saying, we want the next generation to learn about other IT options and make sure they don't suffer from the kind of technology blindness that so many of the current generation suffer from. Bristol's attempts to use open source software instead of Microsoft on its desktop computers have been hampered by the widespread use of proprietary Microsoft standards in Britain's public sector. But Wright is determined not to give in. The city of Bristol will give up its open source ambitions in breaking free of Microsoft over my dead body, says Wright, following a political meeting this past Thursday. A security flaw introduced into Twitter's service following a recent update allowed users to spread spam tweets and automatically redirect users' browsers to offensive and pornographic websites. Mm. Being credited with discovering the flaw in August, Japanese web developer Masato Kinegawa used the exploit to make rainbow-colored tweets, but later that exploit would be utilized by a Scandinavian developer who wanted to see how far the flaw could go, and was astonished to find his code spread at a rate of about 100 users per second, affecting around 500,000 Twitter, Twitter.com users. More recently, curious, curiosity again struck as a 17-year-old Australian boy inadvertently caused a major hack attack on Twitter last week when he decided to see if the rumors were true. Having posted a tweet with malicious code to redirect users to pornographic websites and replicate itself simply by being viewed, the user's tweet brought Twitter to its knees last week and affected possibly millions of users. The massive amount of spam caused confusion and even annoyance as users were redirected, but Twitter reassures its users that the exploit did not reveal any private information such as your user account passwords, so no action is required by the users. Twitter developers have patched the exploit and do not intend to pursue legal action against the individuals who exploited the problem. Wine is an API which allows Linux users to run applications designed to run exclusively on the Microsoft Windows operating system. 
At present, Wine's implementation of DirectX 3D support is limited and does not support DirectX 11 applications. This means limited or no support for Windows DirectX powered games or 3D applications under Linux. Last week, however, Gallium's D3D1X was committed, adding Direct 3D 10-11 support to Linux. The developers are so confident in their work on the API that they claim Direct 3D will inevitably surpass performance of OpenGL on Linux, thanks to the dramatically smaller API and the segregation of all non-trivial work to object creation that the application must perform ahead of time says Luca Barbieri, who made the comment last Tuesday. While this is only an early release, most of the main code is in place to make direct 3D gaming a future reality on Linux. Time will tell how this is implemented into projects such as Wine, as well as graphic card drivers, as Gallium 3D makes this direct 3D support freely available to all. Get the full stories at the Category5.tv newsroom. The Category5 TV Newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. Well, there you have it, Robbie. Can't phase this guy. Can't phase him. <laughs> Tonight's episode of Category 5 Technology TV is brought to you in part by Planet Calypso. Uh, please do check out the free download that's available at cat5.tv slash Calypso. Awesome game. Have you seen Planet Calypso? I... We're going to have to get this guy hooked up. I... It's a free download. I think I did see it. I think you were playing it at work. I probably, I probably <laughs> do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Check out uh, twitter.com slash Robbie Ferguson. Tonight we are starting up with our new feature, Recent Tweets. Here at Category 5 Technology TV. And this tweet comes from Jamie Oliver. The, Everybody's the, familiar with the, the famous chef. The Naked Chef no, back in good. the day. It says, uh, it's a baby boy, guys. I'm shocked. We're all very happy. Mom was amazing. And both are well and happy. Four kids. What? That's Jamie Oliver. Him and his wife had uh, a baby boy. The Naked Chef. Naked Baby. There he is. There you go. There he is. <coughs> and a link to the uh, to the image itself. Guion Paddle says, Hey, Robbie, great program at justin.tv. I happen to connect at you because of Wirecast problem, and I found a really interesting program. Thanks for the uh, for the comment at uh, twitter.com slash Robbie Ferguson. Uh, nice to see you. And I'm glad you found the show. Fantastic. Will Wheaton from Star Trek. Oh. I saw the look in your eyes. You're like, who? <laughs> so the iPad is a fun toy and a great media server. I love that. Fun toy while traveling, but it isn't going to replace a proper computer anytime soon for me. Self-explanatory. There you go. I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm making some organic porcupine meatballs for dinner. Getting them in the slow cooker now. Yum. Can't believe Becca has never tried them. To which Zabata said, what the? <laughs> and the conversation went on where I had to explain that, no, these meatballs are not made from organic porcupine meat. Yes, it's, it's farmed and there's a lot of chemicals. No? A porcupine meatball, of course, being beef with rice mixed in. You're making that up. No, I'm serious. <laughs> Kaspar says, nice show. Hello from Germany. I love Toronto. Just have been there once. Uh, there for four weeks, my best time in life. Nice to have you uh, joining us here on the show. Uh, we're about an hour north of Toronto. Um, so oh, unless Robbie's driving, it's about an hour and a half. But oh, he's the guy who's behind me honking his <laughs> horn, saying, "Pick up the pace! Pick up the pace! Speed limit's 90, Christy." Sorry. So nice to have you joining from uh, from Germany. Brent Spiner, also from Star Trek. This is a uh, Lieutenant Commander Data. Oh, Data. I wish I knew when, the, when Star Trek TNG premiered in 1987. I know it was sometime around now. It's a bit of a kidder. <laughs> that, of course, was on this day. I said uh, to <laughs> Ram Fran Sisak, I'm human, born and raised on Earth. 
but spent some time uh, at Utopia Planitia while my parents were stationed there. Wow. And Corey Claxon, to wrap things up for tonight, the great part about Linux is I can't use Internet Explorer. So no broken web pages. Yes. yes. Sorry, I was helping And out. to that we all say, yeah. 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 You haven't had any good, any bad experiences with Internet Explorer before, have you? Heavens no. No. <laughs> I've coded a few websites in my day. So <laughs> I know what you're talking about, Corey Claxon. You can uh, message us, uh, twitter.com slash Robbie Ferguson. Our hashtag is category5, and we'd love to hear from you uh, on Twitter. Cool. So talking about, uh, well, you've got, uh, you've got a question that you want to take a look at. Yeah? Well, I can tell. Pretty it's, long one. Is it? It's, yeah. Now let's uh, come back to that. Okay. We'll hit, it, we'll hit it one question, then we'll start looking at uh, data security. Here he goes. Okay, well, here we go anyway. This is also from uh, Mr. Kerwin. Um, when you posted a link in the chat room to the Ubuntu forum's discussion about the shutdown restart problem in Ubuntu 10.04, I was a bit disappointed because I had read that discussion before writing to you. However, I thought perhaps I missed something in the first reading and it won't hurt to review what's being said. I'm glad I went back, because on the first page of the discussion, someone reported that their problem had been caused by the OpenOffice.org load at boot time option. As soon as they unchecked that feature in OpenOffice, their Ubuntu problem disappeared. I had skimmed over that first line, but the light bulb went off during the second reading. Of course, shutdown hadn't been a problem the first few days after the hmm. Ubuntu install, but a few days into the new installation, I had a lot of tweaking. And early one morning, I set OpenOffice.org to load at install, since I use Writer constantly. My next shutdown, about 12 hours later that day, was the first one that didn't work. But it had been so many hours since the preload option had been changed that I didn't make the cause and effect association. Hmm. But thanks to you, this isn't really, in fact, a question at all, Robbie. Uh, love testimonials, it's, fi though, too. <laughs> it's fixed at last. <clears throat> and Ubuntu 10.04 is now perfect. Fantastic. One That's cause and effect exactly association. One cause and effect association I do make is that Robbie Ferguson and Category5.tv make for a happier, savvier, proprietary, OS-free computing experience. Regards, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it's good to hear back. I always love, uh, and you hear me say it on the show, let me know if this helps you because sometimes I'm not sure. And that's a case, that particular question was a case where there were so many possible scenarios of what could be the problem. Open Office Auto Start, uh, the quick start of Open Office is known to have that kind of effect on, uh, on many systems. So brilliant that you figured that out. Um, very, very glad that uh, that, that helped. So, and for anyone else who's uh, experiencing problems on shutdown, uh, maybe that's uh, maybe that's your problem. Uh, double check. Just make sure that Open Office uh, that option is turned off in OpenOffice.org, and uh, that should hopefully fix it. Thanks for thanks for letting us know. I'm curious if uh, if we have or have not received any viewer testimonials this week. I want to take a look here, because and it doesn't look like we've got any uh, this past week. So I just encourage you to visit our website. Uh, and uh, that's category5.tv. Click on interact and submit a testimonial. Uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, just to let us know what you think of the show, even just to say hi and, uh, and just say that, uh, where you're viewing from and we'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you, uh, on the other hand, are looking for an answer to your question, you can do so and get your question in in the chat room, category5.tv during the live show, uh, where Eric and I are both watching the chat room. Or uh, if you're not watching this live, or if for some reason you can't join us in the chat room, make sure you email us live at category5.tv. That would be good. We uh, definitely encourage user interaction with this show. And I'm sure you're finding, even in a few weeks. It's very so, interactive. He's, he's flipping screens here. I, you also you should see this. Are you, is it, are you finding <laughs> hey, are it Are you coming out on to, the ice tonight or what? I'm not. No, well, oh, okay. way to go. That's, <laughs> but you're finding your way around. I'm finding my way around. Yeah. It's kind of nice actually having a keyboard as opposed is to a right? laptop that was just out of reach. It seems that this is going to actually work. I was a little concerned 
I don't know if John can maybe put this in the shot, but you've got this big monitor sitting on the desk, and I was a little concerned that it was going to kind of block the view of uh, of the kid man. It seems to be uh, working out. You know what I haven't done? What's that? There's a little shout out to Hillary and say cool beans or anything. Well, you should do that once a show at least. At least once a a show. Yes, indeed. Cool beans. All right. I just, as I see myself coming on the camera, I can't help but think of my my wife saying that I look like a leprechaun this week. Do I look like a leprechaun? You know, seriously. I was thinking maybe for St. Patrick's Day we could uh, work something in there. I could maybe work on something along those lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're, we're not bringing any. Okay. Anything from the St. James Gate Brewery on the show, right? Uh, okay. Okay, fine. What's in the mug? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> it's water with lime tonight. Cheers. So, I uh, on the weekend, Becca had me uh, running around doing a couple of things. We had some... You had uh, the honey-do list? Well, yeah, kind of. Well, we, the kids were homesick on Sunday. And so it was like, okay, we can't really go do anything. So take this time to, to kind of tidy up. What do you think, John? It's looking pretty good in here. Looking pretty good? It's looking good. Yeah. It's looking good. John, so, uh, John gives the thumbs up. Mm-hmm. I noticed it right away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty clean. <laughs> it's a lot of work to keep a studio clean when you got hardware coming and going. But uh, So one of the things that I had to do was take some e-waste uh, to Green Go Recycling Facility. Green Go? Mm-hmm. Sounds like Gringo, but it's Green. Green, green Go. go. There you have it, right here in Barry. They're they're down, yeah, just off of, uh, they're on John Street now. <coughs> Pardon me. Found that out the hard way, because I drove all the way down Arda, which is the other end of town, south end of Barry, and then found out that uh, they had moved. So it wasn't too far, but with the construction downtown, okay. madness. All that said, went there, had an old TV that uh, was not working, so I had to dispose of that. Green Go is a, a free recycling facility that does e-waste. Uh, so I don't want to put this in a, in a dump because that's bad for the environment. What uh, <coughs> places like Gringo will do is they'll dissect that hardware, they'll take out any of the uh, precious metals, things like that, melt them down, and make them into, you know, they'll sell them off as new components. So, well, so they're getting you a new filling in your tooth or something. Yes, With because I have titanium fillings. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so one of the things that I noticed as I'm dropping off my TV, and I'm sure this is completely illegal, but there was a gentleman who was loading up his car with components that people had dumped in the bin. And I (coughs) casually said, you know, what what are you up to? How's it going? How's your day? He's like, oh, I'm just taking apart some of these computers, pulling out any of the hard drives or RAM that is reusable. Thinks he'll take them home and build up another computer or something from the parts, right? So I'm thinking, You've got your hard drive in your computer with all the data on it. You've maybe deleted your files. And then you've dumped this thing in e-waste. And this guy, who, who knows who he is, is taking the hard drive out of that computer, putting it in the back seat of his car, and driving off with your data. All kinds of data. Anything. Or data Credit card numbers. numbers. Whatever. <laughs> We're not talking about an Android. We're talking about the data files okay. on your... So, <laughs> when you delete files off your hard drive, you, you know this, that the, the data is not, the files, because <laughs> he's going to correct me, the files are still there. The ones and zeros are still there. Exactly. So, because when you, when you write a file to your hard drive, data is stored in ones and zeros. So, if you delete the file, all you're doing is you're just deleting from the reference of the drive, basically from a hidden part on the drive that says, okay, you'll find this file here on the platter, but the file itself is still there, even after you delete it. Sometimes even after you format, if the data's still there. So this guy could take that hard drive home, even even if you have wiped out the hard drive, could probably recover a lot of the files and secret stuff off of there. Um, I'm just kind of seeing the chat room here. And and, uh, just to explain that, um, think about forensic. Uh, data recovery. So, you know, you hear, well, you hear on the news about people who are doing things with computers that they shouldn't be and stuff, and of course, forensics uh, come in, they confiscate the equipment, and they're able to recover the data off because when you delete a file, the file's not actually gone. So, in a case like this guy, 
if I'm going to be dropping off my computer at Green Go Recycling Facility, I want to make sure that the hard drive doesn't contain any data if I, in fact, leave the hard drive in. You because when Buddy does the dumpster diving, exactly. you get your drive out. He's got everything that's on that drive. Mm -hmm. Not just everything that was on that drive a week ago when you disposed of it, everything that's been on the drive for potentially years, if you've never, you know, if you've deleted files a year ago, those files could still be there if you haven't overwritten the, the sector space on the hard drive. And with a large drive, say you've got a 250 gigabyte hard drive, chances are pretty good that that little 200K Excel spreadsheet that has all of your personal data, whatever that file is, is still available on that drive. So I want to keep my data safe from, from that guy. Not that he's doing anything malicious necessarily, but he could. So I want to bring your attention to an application called Derek's Boot and Nuke. You okay. heard of that? No, but D -band? there's some other suggestions here in the chat room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see uh, Gadwell is some, actually mentioning that as well. So, well, somebody mentioned that. Somebody mentioned a hammer. Somebody else had well, a blowtorch. <laughs> um, and the hammer idea, though, is it, it's kind of, you know, you, it's, it's messy and, and, it's and nasty and dangerous. called percussive maintenance. Well, you, you, you could have a piece of shrapnel fly up and hit you in the eye. 357 is also suggested here. We, we don't necessarily condone that, condone that idea. <laughs> this is uh, Derek's Boot and Nook. The website is very, very basic. It's a free download. And what this does, I'm just going to read straight off the site. It's a self-contained boot disk that securely wipes your hard drive of most computers. D-Band will automatically and completely delete the contents of any hard disk that it can detect, which makes it an appropriate utility for bulk and emergency data destruction. So that said, you burn this desk. Don't ever boot your computer with it. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> I left it in the drive. Let's think about the, the name <laughs> of the software, boot, boot and Nuke. So consider, as soon as you fire up that computer, it's going to start wiping your data off of any of the drives that are in there. If you're going to be selling a computer on eBay, if you're going to be uh, giving a computer to a friend or donating it to a charity, um, I've even done... Uh, there's some school programs that teach kids to rebuild computers, so I've donated some computers to that. And you want to make sure that you completely wipe out that hard drive. If that's not possible, if you can't wipe out the data from the disk for any reason, for example, the computer doesn't actually boot. Maybe the computer's so far gone that you can't turn it on to use Derek's boot and nuke or DBAN. In that case, what you can do is you can take this during regular business hours to an e-waste recycler. Uh, such as uh, Green Go will do it for you, and they'll actually shred this. They'll turn it into powder, oh. and they'll put this through a special machine that's going to take this drive and completely turn it into just absolutely unusable. So, and then they will separate the components and recycle them as needed. Jot wants you to demonstrate the program. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Jot. We're not going to demonstrate boot and nuke. You download the ISO. It's a CD ISO. You burn it to the disk. And you label it very clearly. Do not boot from this. Instant data destruction. This is strictly for if you, um, if you want to uh, wipe out a hard drive completely. This is going to zero out <coughs> everything on the drive so that the data is no longer recoverable. So even if you took that to a data recovery lab, everything's going to be gone. If that drive contains data or could contain data, make sure you keep backup, obviously because there's no getting the data off of that drive at that, at that point. What about a big bulk eraser, magnetic, electromagnet? Some would say that that's possible, but how do you confirm, right? Because a, a bulk eraser is a, is a strong electromagnet, which could wipe out, if it's powerful enough, it could wipe out the data on the drive, but in such a way that it's actually damaging. Whereas boot and nuke is just wiping out the data, Okay. Correcting everything back to zero because remember everything's zeros and ones. So instead, what we're doing is everywhere there's a one, we're calling it a zero. So essentially, that's to put it in real lay terms. With a bulk eraser, you're actually sector wiping by okay. removing all available data from the drive. If if what happens though is that the electromagnetic uh, field instead damages the circuit board, but actually leaves some of the data on the drive, then somebody with a little know-how could take that circuit board off with a couple of screws, put on a new circuit board, and still access your data. 
because you've got no way to know whether the data okay. is actually sector by sector erased. Maybe it got most of it. Maybe it got it so that the drive no longer worked. Well, it certainly made it so it didn't work. I, I, I did that with the bulk razor yeah. TV station, which we used to do with old yeah. beta tapes and stuff. Yeah, for sure. A lot of guys, uh, of debit cards and credit cards didn't work after they stood too close to the thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that, the, the, I figure the bulk erasers are more for analog stuff. Like you're talking about analog, yeah, or even DAT tapes would would probably do, because you're because you're going to be writing over it. But but for this, I would I would stick more with a sector by sector, or a shredding. Somebody's suggesting a product called Terabytes uh, copy wipes, mm -hmm. or copy wipe. Sure. So there there are many so. suggestions that uh, uh, that are in the chat chat logs for episode number one fifty eight. Different uh, different suggestions altogether. Boot and nuke is specifically just wipe out the drive, make it fast and then throw it in the bin, take it to e-waste recyclers, uh, or give it, you know, reinstall Windows and, and give it to charity or whatever you want to do. Uh, but that gets it so that all of your data is gone, but unlike the magnetic eraser, the drive is still usable. Right. Right. So you're not actually damaging the drive, you're just completely purging all the data. So I'll post links again for, uh, for DBAN in the, uh, in the show notes for episode number 158. And just reiterating that, uh, you know, just remember the story of the guy that I actually saw. <laughs> and uh, he was just taking apart these computers right there. And I just, it just made me realize that, wow, this, this, whoever dropped off these computers had no idea that this guy that I'm looking at right now is going to be taking their hard drives home with them. So, you know, let's hope that, uh, that he's not compromising personal data. Yes, we don't know how savvy this guy is. We don't know. He looked pretty savvy. He knew what he was doing. He knew he He's was looking for hard drives. Dumpster diving, and he looked savvy all at well, the same not, time. Well, it's not a dumpster. Oh, okay, right? okay. It's okay. a bin, <laughs> but it's e-waste. So you've got TVs and printers and okay. computer chassis and components and things. So it's perfectly perfectly reasonable that a guy would go and start picking out components because maybe he's got an old P3 at home or P4. And it uses. Somebody has a 486 that wanted to uh, <laughs> donate for the, uh, the cause here. There you go. We'll demonstrate. <laughs> we'll get all your information off of that drive. So, little word to the wise. Cool. That's 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 my spiel. That's your spiel. That's my spiel. It's a good spiel. Check it out. Dband.org is the website for Derek's boot and nuke, and of course, in the chat logs for episode number 158, you'll see all the suggestions that come from our wonderful chat room. This is Category Five Technology TV. You'll find us online, www.category5.tv. And I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Eric. Eric Kid. And I'm going to hockey now. You're off? I'm, well, it's very like soon. Hockey time. It's hockey time. Well, it was hammer time earlier when we were talking about uh, so are you, fixing uh, hard drives. So are you the youngest guy on the team? Uh, I am not, in fact, the youngest guy on the team, no. You don't say? No. No, I... How <laughs> <laughs> oh, old do you think I am? <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy. Okay. I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. Quick, move on. Yeah. So do 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 You got anything else for me? We got like a, a minute. A whole minute? Yeah, it's been fun having everybody here. Yeah. Hope everybody's had a good time. You do realize you can go to uh, category five dot TV slash newsroom and get That's all the news. All of the news later. Yeah. Podcast will be up uh, this evening. Although last podcast, I did it at 7 o'clock in the morning, and my voice was almost as deep as yours. Wow. And I was like, I, I like this. Live the from the Category, category 5 thing. newsroom. Yeah, this guy. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, somebody suggested I might be 29. Thank might you. Be. 30 years ago. <laughs> but apparently I'm not as old as Drumstick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Good times, good times. Well, we're we're right out of time. Yeah, we're, we're out of time. I had a great time. You had a good time. Yeah, learning your way around the system. The computer works. I'll well. be uh, chatting good. chatting up everybody next week. That's good, John. How are you doing? I'm you're having you're having well. a good time. We've got a camera over there that uh, is a remnant of last week. I think that I yeah. like the idea. We need to get like we need to get this guy a microphone so he doesn't have to yell. But yeah. uh, oh, always nice to have you here. So. Thank you. And uh, thanks for joining us uh, for episode number one fifty eight, the first episode of season four. Thanks for having me. Hard to believe that we're here. We are. Season four.
Brilliant. Can't wait for all the exciting stuff. To it's episode that, three to for come. me. Is it three? <laughs> 158 for me. Actually, we've done a couple of extras on top of that. The point five. So uh, here we go. All right, have a great week, everyone. We'll talk to you again uh, next Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Take care. Don't be late.